listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Cindy Johnson, Operations Manager of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses and 2014 winner of the Len Hadley Volunteerism Award. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Jeremy. Happy to be here. This is episode 84 of Lighthearted, slated for October 12th, 2020. But we are recording this on October 2nd. And since it's October 2nd, I want to give a shout out to our other co-host of this podcast, Michelle Jewell Shaw. October 2nd is her birthday. Of course, she won't be hearing this until later, but I can't let the day go by without wishing Michelle a happy birthday. Yeah, happy birthday, Michelle. On October 12th, 1792, the first celebration of Columbus Day was held in New York City. And on this date in 1892, the Pledge of Allegiance was first recited by students in many U.S. public schools. The Australian actor Hugh Jackman was born on October 12, 1968. He once said, quote, I've always felt that if you back down from a fear, the ghost of that fear never goes away. It diminishes people, unquote. I agree with that. You know, when I was a kid, I was scared to death of spiders. I wouldn't go into a room if I thought a spider might be in it. Then I started looking at them more closely and reading about them, and I realized that spiders are actually really interesting. Strange, but interesting. Uh, And I'm not afraid of them anymore. I was also deathly afraid of public speaking, but now I've done hundreds of lectures about lighthouses. (laughs) You sure have. (laughs) Uh, Mostly by Zoom lately, but uh, they're still lectures. So uh, I do agree that you can't back down from your fears. In this episode, we are going to revisit a lighthouse we featured on this podcast twice before. Our guest has written a new book about Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse in Maryland, which is one of a small number of lighthouses to be designated a National Historic Landmark. Cindy, please help me tell our listeners about Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse and David Gendel. Sure, Jeremy. Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse, located offshore from the southern tip of the peninsula where Annapolis, Maryland is located, is the last surviving screw pile lighthouse in Chesapeake Bay. The light station was established in 1838 and the current lighthouse was built in 1875. Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse consists of a hexagonal cottage style dwelling on a screw pile foundation. By 1964, Thomas Point Shoal was the last staffed offshore station on Chesapeake Bay. The station was fully automated and de-staffed by the Coast Guard in 1986. Today, the city of Annapolis owns the lighthouse. The city leases it to the Chesapeake chapter of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. The Annapolis Maritime Museum houses exhibits on the lighthouse and serves as the departure point for tours. A lifelong Chesapeake Bay sailor, David Gundell is the co-founder of Spin Sheet, an Annapolis-based Chesapeake Bay sailing magazine. He's a U.S. Coast Guard licensed captain, an accomplished racing sailor, and an earnest fisherman. He's a distinguished alumni of St. Mary's High School in Annapolis and, between sailing adventures, graduated from Randolph-Macon College in Virginia. Where my brother John teaches history, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Uh, In 2004, David was the MC of the transfer ceremony that shifted ownership of the Thomas Point Schultz Lighthouse from the federal government to the city of Annapolis and its partners. He lives in Annapolis with his family. David's new book, Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse, a Chesapeake Bay icon, published by the History Press, comes out today, October 12th. In addition to covering the history of Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse, the book covers the history of the point, the shoal, and the previous stone lighthouse, as well as the port of Baltimore. The final section of the book is devoted to the ongoing preservation efforts at the lighthouse. A portion of the proceeds from the book will be donated to the Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse Preservation Efforts. I spoke with David Gendel at the end of August. Let's listen to that conversation now. I am speaking with David Gendel today, and this is pretty exciting, David, because you have a new book, Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse at Chesapeake Bay Icon, coming out, and it actually even though we're talking on the last day of August, this episode of the podcast will actually be released or posted on October 12th, which is the day the book is coming out. So the timing uh, works out well. So thank you so much for spending some time with me today, David. 
Thank you for uh, the opportunity. I'm a big fan of, uh, of what you do and the whole program there. So uh, it's a real honor to be here today. You were telling me you have some background in New England. I'm in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. How did you get interested in history as a kid? Yeah, so I, I, I grew up um, as one of three boys uh, in Annapolis, Maryland, um, you know, in a family that was, was crazy about boats and crazy about the water and, you know, all kinds of boats and, and, and all kinds of activities on the water. You know, and when you grow up in Annapolis and on the, on the Chesapeake Bay, you know, history is all around you. You know, you live it, right? I, I, I went to school, uh, elementary school and high school in a, um, in a school that's on the grounds of, uh, of Charles Carroll's house uh, and property in Annapolis, which is... Uh, you know, he was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. And, and you know, so history, history is always all around us. And we vacationed and spent a lot of time in New England in the summer. You know, great tradition down here on the Chesapeake Bay in the height of summer where it's humid and hot and the bay has, uh, has stinging nettles in it and there's mosquitoes out uh, to retreat up to New England for a week or two to reset. And, um, you know, we would go up to Cape Cod and coastal New England, you know, and, and end up in the harbors and, and the lighthouses and along the coast there. And, you know, my imagination between all that was just stoked as a kid. You know, the history was around you. You walked on the streets. You you, you looked out across the same harbors. You sailed on the same waters. And, you know, for, for a kid like me, a love of history and of stories and storytelling and personalities from the past uh, really took root. And I, and, I never, and I never let that go. Also, you've been an avid sailor for many years. And I imagine you sailed past Thomas uh, Point Shoal Lighthouse many yeah, times. Yeah, absolutely. We, um, I grew up, as I said, uh, with on a boat crazy family, and you know, we we sailed, uh, we sailed a lot. You know, dinghies all the way through uh, racing sailboats, and you know, there were there's a lot of lighthouses just near us. Actually, where we grew up was closest to Baltimore Light, which is um, off the uh, the mouth of the Magothy River, just north of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, and uh, you know, that was relatively close to my house where I grew up. About five or eight miles south is Thomas Point Shoal off Annapolis, and that's near where I live now. And, you know, we would sail by these all the time. You know, I've, I have great memories as being a boy of going by Thomas Point and seeing the um, uh, keepers come out and give a wave, you know, as we sailed by. We would, that was a great highlight. And, uh, you know, so, so it was part of, you know, Thomas Point, Baltimore Light, Sandy Point Light, Bloody Point Light. You know, all, all the lighthouses in the Annapolis area were, were part of my, uh, my childhood and, and, you know, great memories. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great to remember the uh, the keepers waving to you. What a what a great memory that is. I think I might know the answer to this, but let me ask you: Did you consider yourself a lighthouse buff before doing this book? I, I did. Again, it's hard to be a boater around here in Annapolis and on the Chesapeake Bay and not be exposed to lighthouses all the time, right? We've got we've got a great variety of them here, and you know the Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse is. It's so iconic and so important here on the bay. So, uh, yeah, you know, I was a lighthouse buff. I was into the history of them, you know, absolutely. And, and Thomas Point came into my life in a little bit of a closer manner. So not just sailing by it, but actually, you know, getting involved in 2004. So, uh, you know, in 2004 was when the uh, ownership of the lighthouse was transferred from the federal government to the consortium of of local groups here led by the city of Annapolis, the U.S. Lighthouse Society and its Chesapeake chapter and others. And I was actually asked to be the MC and kind of the host of the, uh, of the handover event. So, uh, you know, suddenly Thomas Point was, was a deep part of my life. You know, we spent yeah. a lot of time preparing for that event. You know, there were, there was uh, loaded with VIPs from the lighthouse world and from the, uh, the government and, and, you know, locally and, uh, you know, got to spend a lot of time planning that event and then up on the stage as the handover took place. So, so Thomas Point came, came into my life, you know, in, in full force uh, back in 2004. So it's like an old friend now. So if we could talk a little bit about the, the early history of the lighthouse. I understand the original Thomas Point light, lighthouse was in a different location. You know, Baltimore, you can't overstate the role of the Port of Baltimore um, in the early 19th century development of the, of the U.S. economy and, and you know, the regional economy, but the whole national economy. Baltimore was massively important. You know, it was, a, it was a very Western port. You know, it was about as far West as you could get and still be in tidal water that was connected to the, um, to the ocean directly. It had railroad lines develop out into the Midwest. It was on that um, that fall line road that went up and down the East Coast. So, so it was very centrally located. And for much of the 19th century, Baltimore was the second largest city in the United States. And it was a real economic engine. The issue was 
uh, getting up and down the bay from uh, the open Atlantic was a hundred or so miles. And, you know, there were, there were shoals along the way, there were a few twists and turns along the way, um, you know, and they had to be marked. And, and Thomas Point, which was, uh, you know, just south of Annapolis, went out about the shoal about a mile and a quarter into the bay, reaching out towards those shipping lanes. So a lot of interest from uh, the, the port of Baltimore to put a, a mark there on the end of the shoal, right? That was, uh, that was the goal, a mile and a half from land. They wanted a light and, you know, as early as 1825, there were drives from Baltimore shipping interests to put a light there to mark that shoal. You know, it wasn't an especially treacherous shoal. Uh, you know, let's, let's, let's call it what it is. It's the Chesapeake Bay, right? So there's no rocks, there's no coral, there's no, uh, you know, there's no razor sharp uh, edges that you're going to catch your ship on, but it is muddy and it is hard and it will stop your ship and it will interrupt your, your transit up or down the bay. So, um, you know, right off the bat, they didn't have the technology and they didn't have the funding to develop the technology to put a proper light out on the end of the shoal more than a mile from land. So a 30 foot high stone tower was built on the land itself. So uh, 30 feet high, relatively modest tower. Uh, the first one wasn't especially well built. This was in 1825. It actually began to erode away and fall away and it was rebuilt nearby a few years later uh, from the same material. So, you know, let's think about it for a second. A 30 foot high tower a mile and a half from deep water, not super effective, right? Trees grew up around it. It was, you know, constantly being reported as difficult to see. Um, you know, that shoal continued to menace all the way through the, the Civil War and, and beyond. What eventually led to the building of the present lighthouse? As you know, and as your listeners know, um, coming out of the Civil War, the Lighthouse Board uh, was reorganized, was reinvigorated, had some, some very strong personalities on there, many with military backgrounds. And, and they got very serious about firming up the, the United States network of lighthouses, right? So post-Civil War, this was absolutely a priority. You know, it, it, was, it, it got very real in the lighthouse establishment, you know, after the Civil War. What also happened was two bits of technology uh, evolved around that same time which enabled um, you know, a series of lighthouses to be built relatively cheaply that were incredibly effective, right? So it's the Fresnel lens comes into uh, widespread use here in the United States and the development of screw pile technology, which uh, enabled builders to screw iron, uh, iron fittings into the base of the, uh, of the Chesapeake Bay in this case, and then build a, a prefabricated platform on top of it. So uh, you know, we suddenly had two bits of technology, Fresnel lens, screw pile technology, in the equation, which were not available you know, widespread before the Civil War in the United States. So in 1875, you know, Thomas Point got its proper screw pile lighthouse a mile and a quarter from the shore on the end of the shoal with a, uh, with a Fresnel lens in it. So we, uh, we got a, finally got a proper lighthouse lit in uh, November 1875. How difficult was it to build a screw pile lighthouse in that position? Great question. You know, screw pile lighthouses, uh, as you and your listeners are, are, are likely familiar, typically work in relatively shallow water, relatively protected waters, right? So think bays and sounds and rivers and, you know, inside the, um, the sounds of North Carolina and up in the Chesapeake Bay tributaries are typically where they worked. Out on the end of a shoal in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay was a bit of an ambitious spot to put a, to put a screw pile. So, uh, you know, they, they built it over the course of the summer of 1875, not many records about the building. You know, we, you know, we know it was very matter-of-factly put together. The, um, the parts were prefabricated and the kit, was, the kit was assembled up in Baltimore where there was a lighthouse depot uh, in the inner harbor of Baltimore, shipped down on a, uh, you know, behind a lighthouse tender uh, called the Tulip and, um, you know, assembled here. Again, doesn't appear to be any drama in, in the building of it, not, not a lot of records, no contemporary newspaper accounts other than it's being built and it is built and it is lit. Um, you know, later that technology at that site proved, you know, proved to be a little bit challenging, but the actual building of it uh, seems to be fairly straightforward. So the Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse was manned for 111 years. Did mm -hmm. families ever live in that lighthouse? Yeah, so Thomas Point, um, you know, was 
for most of its life was a stag lighthouse. You know, it, it was a lighthouse uh, just for male keepers. There were never any female keepers of, of Thomas Point. Uh, we do have some records in the very early years of some wives and some children out there with keepers. So, uh, you know, in the first crew that was out there was a keeper and two assistants. And, you know, there are some records, uh, including, um, you know, some, some challenges they went through with, with a wife and a, a child aboard. But, uh, but it was very rare and it was quickly discontinued. What are some of the stories uh, of the keepers of the lighthouse that really stand out for you? Yeah, so I've got, uh, I've got a couple that I dive into in the book that were absolute treasures to, uh, to pull out, right? And, and you know, you and, you and your listeners live in this world all the time, and, and, and you obviously know that uh, you've got the physical structure of the lighthouse, which is appealing and technologically interesting and visually, uh, aesthetically pleasing. But at the same time, you know, the men and women that, that kept the light and that, that worked on the light have stories of their own, which, which you know, when you unpack them are, are, are absolutely thrilling. The very first keeper at Thomas Point was a gentleman named Eugene Birchenall. And I did a fair amount of research into Mr. Birchenall. He, um, he was from the Eastern Shore of Maryland, and he enlisted in the Civil War uh, in a Delaware, uh, a Delaware brigade. He was wounded as a young man at, at Antietam, fighting for, the, uh, fighting for the United States at Antietam suffered a, a, a fairly um, severe wound and, uh, you know, exited, re-upped in the army a couple of years later, and, and eventually became a lighthouse keeper. He was the first keeper at, at Thomas Point um, you know, with that great Civil War record and a Civil War injury to go along with it. I stayed on, uh, on Birch and All, mostly because the first full winter that they were at the, at the lighthouse, you know, the winter of 1876 into 1877, the lighthouse was struck by ice flows. Uh, the ice was breaking up on the Chesapeake Bay and flowing out the bay, these sheets of ice, and, um, and did some severe damage to the new screw pile. They did not have the rocks and riprap and ice breakers around the base that they do now. So those iron uh, screws, very spindly screws, were exposed to the ice. And you know, it, the, the lighthouse leaned over. The, um, the, the lamp oil spilled all over the floor. The, the, there was damage to the lens. There was damage to some of the fittings in the lighthouse. And, and Birchenall and his assistants actually had to abandon the lighthouse uh, for fear that they were going to be carried away uh, in these ice flows. And they made their way ashore through the ice and um, relit the light at the top of the old tower and immediately got word you know, up to Annapolis and then to Baltimore that they had shifted the light. You know, they, so they, they held their duty the entire way through, even in this somewhat terrifying um, environment. So I tell that story, you know, got out the, um, the Lighthouse Board records, some newspaper accounts of it, and we're able to hang some, uh, some color on that story, which I really, uh, really enjoyed. And then fast forward 100 years later, another keeper that I got into was, uh, was the first African-American keeper at the Lighthouse, a, a gentleman uh, from North Carolina named John White. And, um, you know, Keeper White was a uh, Coast, Guard, uh, Coast Guardsman, obviously, um, in the 1970s. And uh, he was the keeper at the 100th anniversary of the Lighthouse. So uh, 1975, you know, when those ceremonies were going on and Keeper White was out there, I, I found that, um, you know, that just a wonderful uh, way to tie together the, uh, the hundred year span there. Uh, and so we have a bit about, uh, about Keeper White's time and he came back a few years ago, spent some time at the lighthouse and uh, got to see the preservation efforts and was, you know, was very moved. So we have, we have those stories in the book as well. What about other more recent keepers or descendants of earlier keepers? Did, were you able to talk to some of those? In the Coast Guard era, the keepers were rotating through and they were Coast Guardsmen. So in theory, they could be from anywhere in the, in the United States. And, uh, you know, but prior to the Coast Guard era, uh, in the early, up through the early part of the 20th century, you know, many of the keepers were from Baltimore or, uh, or the Carolinas or, or, or you know, this, this region. And, and some of their descendants are here. We had keeper descendants um, at that handover ceremony in 2004. And my favorite keeper descendant is a, a, a Captain Howard Lewis, who uh, runs the shuttle boat for the Annapolis Maritime Museum back and forth out to the lighthouse. So he, uh, he's the great grandson of a, uh, of a Thomas Point keeper. I was able to interview him for the book. I was able to ride with him multiple times out there to the, to the lighthouse on his, uh, on his boat. And he's been deeply involved in the preservation you know, ever since 2004. So where did you do your research for the book? I love the research. You know, that, that's obviously 
for for anybody that's doing history and nonfiction, you know, you, you have to be based uh, you know, based based in, in rigorous research. And, and I knew early on, you know, I, I had I'd written about lighthouses before, and I knew that this was a community that you absolutely have to get it right. You know, th this is a community that's uh, you know that takes great pride in in having it right. So. I spent a fair amount of time in the National Archives, uh, multiple trips to the Washington DC archives and to the uh, National Archives too in College Park, Maryland, and, uh, and pulled out pretty much everything about Thomas Point um, and then Baltimore and, and surrounding areas that I could find there. And you know, there, there, was, there was pretty decent material. I um, was able to find the plans and, and some photos and then a lot of correspondence in the DC office uh, were able to help me flesh out the book. So, uh, so those were my two, um, you know, go-tos. The Maryland State Archives uh, here in Annapolis also had some material. Um, I was able to access the records of the Maryland Gazette and the Baltimore Sun back um, into the early 19th century, which uh, also helped me flesh out, you know, some of the human aspects of the story. So you can only get so much out of official records, right? You, you, you need some, some color occasionally. And, uh, you know, I was able to flesh those out with some newspaper, uh, uh, newspaper accounts from the Sun and the Gazette. So uh, you know, the research was fun and it was important. And um, a fair amount of research done before me, obviously, through volunteers at the uh, Lighthouse Society and the Chesapeake chapter of the Lighthouse Society. So uh, you know, I, I dove into that as well. You know, Sandy from the Chesapeake chapter is is unbelievable, and she uh, she's a historian, and she helped me uh, over the years uh, answering my questions and uh, you know making sure I got it right. So how long did it take you to research and write the book? Well, great question. I, I had a little bit of a head start on this one. You know, I, I was the co-founder and editor of a, of a boating magazine here in Annapolis for many years, you know, beginning in 1995. And, you know, as, as part of that, I was able to assign myself uh, research stories over the years. So in the winter, when there wasn't a lot of boating going on, I could fill pages with, with research stories. And, and, you know, I was able to build my, um, you know, build my skills and my ability to, uh, to do the research and write nonfiction cleanly and accurately on those stories over the years. And, you know, obviously in 2004 with the handover, I was involved in that. I began doing research on, on Thomas Point and for an eventual writing project. And, you know, that initial winter incident I mentioned from 1877 was just fascinating to me. Like, I love the idea that a, uh, that a Civil War veteran you know, was out there, took the damage, they, they fulfilled their duty, went ashore, relit the old tower. Like the visuals of that were so strong to me. So I, I did a fair amount of that research and, and, and chased down a lot, of, uh, a lot of Lighthouse histories. It wasn't until, you know, I would say maybe a year ago that I was out there fishing one night um, at a sunset. You know, I, we, we slip out to Thomas Point after, uh, after the workday's over and, and, and fish for striped bass, um, rockfish as we call them around here. And, and, I'm, and I'm casting at the base of it where the rockfish like to hang out and, and said, you know, there's no book about Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse. I can't believe it. 1875, National Historic Landmark. No one's ever done a book on this thing. So my process then was I, I went back and that night, um, you know, came back home and ordered four or five books on lighthouses from around the United States, you know, uh, Point Bonita Light and Gay Head Light and Cape Hatteras and just ordered a few books and, and, and they all arrived and looked through them. You know, this is middle of the summer of, of 2019. And the one, that I, the one that jumped out at me, I said, I really like the way this book is formatted. I really like the way this book is, is put together. It was on Gay Head Lighthouse up in New England. So I, I reached out to the publisher the next day and, and said, hey, I, I, you know, I, I live near Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse. And, and this is why I think I'm qualified to write this book. And, you know, let's do this. And, and believe it or not, they got back with me almost immediately and said, we've been, you know, that, that we're overdue for a book on Thomas Point Shoal. You're the right person. Let's make this happen. So, so I dove in and I think through most of the fall of 19 and into this past winter, uh, into early 2020, I was very focused on, uh, on this, you know, above all other projects. Uh, so full time, I would say probably four or five months of, uh, of work on this, um, wrapped it up in early 2020. And submitted it. Uh, unfortunately, the publication was delayed uh, due to the coronavirus. So here we are now in October, and it's coming out. So uh, you know that that's that's the rough timeline of how we put this together. 
Well, it reminds me, you know, people have asked me, uh, I've written a number of Lighthouse books and people have, will ask me sometimes, how long did it take you to write that book? And they're a little surprised when I say the actual writing was, like you said, maybe maybe four or five months or whatever, but it's actually in a way the result of years and years of research. So You say that exactly right, Jeremy. Um, you know, I've, I've had a Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse folder on my computer and then another manila envelope you know, next to my desk with documents in it, probably for 15 years, right. you know, and I dropping material in there and, and starting and stopping notes in there. And, and as things would come across my desk. Yeah. So it, it took, it took four or five months slash 15 years, right? That's how you would describe right, exactly. that. <laughs> That's yeah. Okay. You don't, you don't start from a, uh, from a cold start on a project like this and do it in, in four months. Right. If, right. if you want to get it right. Also, it, it's a lot more. Yep. I've worked with the uh, the History Press. My only book that had nothing to do with lighthouses I did with the History Press, and that was a, a really good experience. Well, that's good to hear. You know, they've been spectacular so far, and, and you know we're going to work on getting the book out to um, obviously online outlets, but also it's important to me that the book is also sold uh, sold regionally You know, in stores. Um, that, that's so important to me. I owned a, uh, a small business in Annapolis for many years, and support the um, the small business community along the waterfront. And uh, so if we can get this book out into some of those shops and things and, uh, and sell some that way and support them with events or, or signings, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about that part of it. So it's coming out on October 12th, which is the day that uh, a lot of people will be hearing this, the day that the, this episode of the podcast will come out. And I'm wondering, are there any special events planned around the publication date? Yeah, so uh, a little bit tricky again in our um, in our pandemic environment. You know, um, here in Maryland, uh, at least at the time we're recording this in in, in late August, you know, we, we are still uh, under some severe restrictions for uh, for the for the coronavirus, and you know, trying to be respectful of those. So to that end, you know, the Annapolis boat shows in October have been canceled, which is you know, very unfortunate because there's a sailboat show. Uh, and then the sec- next weekend, there's a powerboat show and, you know, tens of thousands of people uh, come to those from all over the world. So we originally were scheduled to release the book in conjunction with those boat shows. And, uh, and we're going to have events and signings and, you know, books available at the boat shows. So with those canceled, we've kind of scrambled a bit to try to figure out what happens. So we've got some virtual events that are coming up. You know, I'm, uh, I've got trips out um, on some of the tour boats here in Annapolis where I'm going to be giving a uh, giving talks on the schooner Woodwind, which is a, uh, a schooner that's based here in Annapolis Harbor. Uh, going to be giving some talks on the watermark vessels. That's the, uh, the fleet of tour boats that are here in Annapolis. Um, and I expect that, uh, that by the time this gets uh, aired, we'll have a few more uh, events uh, book solid, you know, to make up for those missing boat show events. Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse has had some recent work done. Some of the metal beams have been replaced. The Chesapeake chapter of the U.S. Lighthouse Society, which you mentioned earlier, has uh, had done an amazing job with the, the restoration. Uh, why is it important that the lighthouse be preserved? I've been out there uh, a few times this summer and, and you know, obviously in prior years. And, and John Potvin is the uh, lighthouse manager. I believe you know, you know him and your listeners know John. And, uh, you know, he's a friend and he was very helpful as we got this book organized you know, and also helping me fact check. I would say the last 25% of the book is, is devoted to what's happening out there now, just because mm-hmm. it's, it's amazing to me. You know, I, I love the stories of the keepers and we touched on some of that earlier, but, but the stories of the people who are devoting their time and their expertise to preserving this, to me, are serving the lighthouse in a different way, but they're still serving the lighthouse. And, uh, you know, the fundraising has been real. The volunteer hours out there have been real. Um, you know, uh, uh, it's just been very inspiring to see the, the lighthouse is in, in pretty amazing shape right now. Uh, you know, I was out there just the other day um, and we had gone out with a crew of woodworkers from the Chesapeake Woodworking Guild. So these were, uh, th- these were, these were woodworkers with great expertise who were volunteering their time. They were out there for a nine hour day, you know, working on the shingles and some of the exterior of, uh, of the structure. So, uh, you know, to answer your question, why is this important? I think that, that you know, we all, we all love lighthouses. We love what they stand for. We love the history of them. Uh, you know, the continuity from 1875 to 2020, to me, it is amazing. Same spot, 
you know, same lighthouse, same screws into the bottom of the bay. Those are, those are all original and it's there. So it's witnessed, you know, the switch from sails to steam to modern shipping. You know, it's witnessed uh, all sorts of, of military and commercial vessels, and recreational vessels going by. It was originally put there to, uh, to safely mark that route up to Baltimore. It's been called redundant, you know, maybe not needed anymore, but it, you know, in my belief, it's needed now more than ever, right? The story of that lighthouse and the continuity of it in that same place, the people that devoted time to it really is inspiring. And, and you know, I, I think our fragile little screw pile lighthouse, which was probably uh, you know, a little risky to put out there on the end of a shoal in 1875, the fact that it's still there in its original place it is very moving, you know, when I when I think about it. It it's uh it, it was a bit of an underdog positioned out there and and it's still there. And uh, you know, so I, I think it's critical to tell that story and, and not let that story get lost of the physical structure and of the people that uh that have that have devoted uh time and energy to it. Well the preservationists today and people like you are really the the keepers of the lighthouses today in a very, very real sense. Uh so History is still being written as we speak. You touched on this earlier, but I just want to restate how people can get the book. I know that it's uh, it will be available online and so forth. Yeah, it'll be available um, at your usual online outlets. You know, if you'd like to buy it directly from the publisher, it's the History Press, um, Acadia Publishing, out of South Carolina. They've got it available on their site. At, at your normal, um, you know, your normal online booksellers uh, will have it. You know, locally, it, it should be at the Annapolis Maritime Museum. You know, it should be at, at West Marine Annapolis. It should be at, uh, at Fawcett's Annapolis, which is a great, uh, a great shop. Uh, you know, we're working on getting it into the uh, Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum over in St. Michael's, uh, into the Mariner's Museum in, uh, in Newport News, Virginia, and beyond. But uh, if you're not in the region, you know, you can find it directly from the publisher or via your favorite uh, online outlet. Now, I understand a, a portion of the proceeds from the book uh, is being donated to the uh, preservation effort. Yeah, that, that's been part of it from the beginning. You know, I, I learned that in, in 2004 when I met, you know, folks from the Lighthouse Society and, and, and you know, people like you that, are, that, that have spent so much time and, and devoted your talent to, to this space. I'm writing this book because nobody had written about this wonderful thing before. Nobody had told the story of the preservationists and, and what they're doing. You know, th that's my primary goal for writing this. So I I'm absolutely committed to that, you know, I, I, portion of the proceeds back into preservation efforts. You know, John Potvin has led an unbelievable fundraising effort out there um, the last few years. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've contributed to it in the past and I'll continue to contribute to it. Uh, you know, that that's, that's why we're, uh, that's why we're doing this. We got to tell the story and, and keep keep the light lit. Right. That's uh, great that you're you're helping out with that in so many ways. I have one more question for you for bonus points. All right. <laughs> so prepare. Get your thinking cap on. Get your pens. Get your number two pencil ready. Uh, what was your favorite part of working on the book? So my favorite part of that's great. Uh, my favorite part of working on the book is you know well the research is the research is is fun. You know, you're, you're unraveling a mystery. You've written books before. You know, you're chasing down threads. You're unraveling mysteries. When you find primary sources and can lock up something, that's great. But, you know, you're in typically uh, under, under fluorescent lights in an over air conditioned archive or, or archival facility, you know, with, a, uh, with nowadays with a swipe card to get in and out and to check out materials. And especially at the National Archives, you know, it's a, it's a very institutionalized feel. And, Although the documents that come out, you know, the original documents are, are incredibly special and, you know, have a life of their own, you're still, you know, you're in an institutionalized archival environment. So I had a couple breakthrough sessions um, in College Park where I, I really felt like I got my handle on um, a few of the history threads. And then a few days later, I was invited out to the lighthouse uh, and jumped on the, on the Audacious, is the name of the boat, with, uh, with Captain Howard great grandson of a keeper he took me out there you know we met john potvin out there and it was a humid hot kind of sticky chesapeake bay summer morning and to step foot on on the station uh and and climb up that uh that iron ladder and, and go through the hatch out onto the deck having 
you know, 48 hours earlier have been elbow deep in the archives uh, in College Park uh, and then connecting it to the physical structure. You know, I, I, I had a moment, you know, I, I had a moment as I stood up there. Um, you know, it became very real to be, to be back aboard the station, um, you know, having, having done so much research uh, at the archives. So that, that was my favorite, my favorite moment. So that's, that's just great. You've gotten to know that lighthouse from so many angles and in such a, a personal way. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, going from a boy sailing by it with my mom and dad and, you know, hopeful that the keeper would come out and give us a wave, you know, through the, the, the honor of being the first person to publish a, a book on the, on the subject, you know, with great input and help from the community uh, around us. You know, to me, I, I, I said to my kids the other night, I feel like I'm now a, a small part of this lighthouse story, right? I'm a I'm a I'm a sentence in this longer lighthouse uh, history, and uh, you know, just to be associated with it, um, it, it's so cool for me. So I'm I'm really uh, I'm really excited about that. Yeah, you are uh, now a part of the history of Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse, but that history is still being written, and for for you, and my, you know, it's not like. Uh, the history won't go on for, for many, many years to come. That's right. I mean, we, we, get, we have the John Potvins and the Lighthouse Society volunteers and the Woodworking uh, Guild and, and the Maryland Historic Trust and everyone has donated money. I mean, we're, we're all working together to make sure that that, that keeps going. And five years, uh, and, and incredibly, is the 150th uh, anniversary of it. And, um, you know, that's amazing to think. It is. So congratulations. On, on, and I want to thank you for your involvement in uh, preserving the lighthouse on behalf of lighthouse fans everywhere. And thank you and congratulations uh, on writing this book. Uh, I really look forward to, to reading it. I, I've uh, peeked at the, the pages that they, the preview pages that they show you on Amazon. And uh, I can see it's very plain to see that it's a, it's a very thorough and well-written book. So uh, well, congrats. thank you. Thank you so much. This is important to me, you know, to to speak with you and and you know the the members of the of the society and the and the lighthouse aficionados community. You know, uh, it, it was it was the the efforts of, of you and people like you and your listeners that uh, that got us to this point with with Thomas Point Shoal and that will carry us through. So you know, uh, if I uh, if I can do a little bit to help promote things and push things along and celebrate those that have worked on the lighthouse. Uh, you know, I, I feel like I've accomplished something. So, so thank you for this opportunity. Oh, you're very welcome. So just to, to recap uh, one final time, your new book that comes out the same day that this uh, podcast episode is being released. The book is Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse, a Chesapeake Bay icon. And uh, I wish you all the best with the book and uh, all your endeavors with the lighthouse and, and elsewhere. So thank you so much for spending some time with me today, David. I, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Jeremy. I really enjoyed it. This year, tours of Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse were canceled because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Normally, the tours leave from the Annapolis Maritime Museum on Saturdays. The museum partnered with the Chesapeake chapter of the U.S. Lighthouse Society and the city of Annapolis to manage and preserve the lighthouse. You can learn more about the tours at the Annapolis Maritime Museum's website at amaritime.org, that's A-M-A-R-I-T-I-M-E dot org, or at the U.S. Lighthouse Society website at uslhs.org. On the Society's website, click About and then click Thomas Point Lighthouse. Thank you to everyone who's rated and reviewed this podcast on Apple Podcasts. If you listen to us through Apple Podcasts, we'd appreciate it if you could post a rating and review. Also, anything you can do to spread the word about the podcast on social media is greatly appreciated. Thanks to all the staff, volunteers, and members of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. Again, check out uslhs.org to learn about the tours, passport program, preservation grants, the quarterly journal, and everything else the Society offers. And please consider making a donation or becoming a member. This podcast is made possible by your donations. Thanks to everyone everywhere who works to preserve lighthouses and other historic sites. Preservation is not about the past, it's about the future. As always, thanks for listening and... Keep a good light.
Let it shine, let it shine 